Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Nancy Netzer, the inaugural Robert L. and Judith T. Winston, director of the McMullen Museum and professor of art at Boston College. And I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you to our lecture by Linda Ferber, Director Emerita and Senior Art Historian of the New York Historical Society. The lecture is organized to accompany our exhibition in the Daly Family Gallery, William Trost Richards, Hieroglyphs of Nature. I also want to remind you that <clears throat> if you want to view the exhibitions after the lecture, our galleries remain open on Thursday evenings until 8 o'clock. I've asked Jeffrey Howe, the curator of Hieroglyphs of Landscape, to introduce Dr. Ferber, the foremost scholar on the art of William Trost Richards. And we're indeed honored that she's agreed to participate in our exhibition catalog and to speak here this evening. Before I turn the microphone over to Jeffrey Howe, I'd like to extend appreciation to Rachel Chamberlain, who organized this evening's event, and to acknowledge the central role that alumnus and parents William and Allison Bereka played in the realization of the exhibition. The Varenkas have been collectors and the principal gallerists holding Richard's works for decades. In 2004, they donated to the McMullins six works by Richards, which inspired Jeffrey Howe, a specialist in 19th century painting, to focus his research on the artist after he retired to become emeritus professor in 2018. I also want to thank the collectors to whom the Varekas introduced us and who have generally loaned works to this most comprehensive exhibition. And we're so pleased that many of you can join us this evening. Finally, I want to extend appreciation on behalf of the museum to the docents who are guiding tours through the exhibition and to the McMullen patrons and Marianne and Vincent Jafuni who have supported this exhibition so generously. And now I'm going to turn over the program to Professor Jeffrey Howe to introduce Dr. Linda Ferber, to whom we extend a very warm welcome. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you all for coming this evening, and particular thanks to the lenders, who I'm delighted to see um, here in the context with their pictures. It's a nice, nice conjunction. Um, it's my very great honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Linda S. Ferber this afternoon. As you can see, she's going to speak to us on the topic of how the sea kills the trees, new narratives in uh, marine painting. Now, as Nancy mentioned, Dr. Ferber is one of the foremost scholars of American art of any time. And she has, uh, she's a foundational figure for the study of William Trost Richards. She's the senior art historian and museum director emerita of the New York Historic Society. And prior to that, she was chair of the American Art Department at Brooklyn Museum of Art and Andrew Mellon, curator of American art. Before that, she'd been the chief curator for the Brooklyn Museum for 15 years, from 1985 to 2000. She's a founding trustee of the Association of American Art, of Art Museum Curators and serves on the New York Advisory Committee for the Archives of American Art. She knows everything. <laughs> I can test to that. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, she graduated from Bernard College and received her PhD from Columbia. Her dissertation on William Trost Richards was published in 1980, and it's still an invaluable resource, as I and my fellow contributors to our exhibition catalog can attest. My copy is just about worn out, <laughs> and I still go back to it. Uh, 
And she's constantly coming up with fresh ideas. I think this afternoon's presentation is going to give us an entirely new way of looking at these pictures. She's the author of many dozens of books and articles on 19th century American art and has curated many groundbreaking exhibitions at the Brooklyn Museum and elsewhere, including The New Path, Ruskin and American Pre-Raphaelites, Albert Bierstadt, Art and Enterprise, Masters of Light and Color, Homer Sargent and the American Watercolor Movement, and most recently she was guest curator at the National Gallery of Art for a show, that wonderful show this summer, of the American Pre-Raphaelites, uh, Radical Realists. It's a beautiful catalog. I highly recommend it. I think I saw someone with it. This after ah, <laughs> yes, okay. And she's received many, many awards, uh, many articles published. We will, uh, her contribution to our catalog was also titled, How the Sea Kills the Trees. Uh, and these new interpretations make this most interesting artist even more interesting, if possible. There's no one better suited to introduce us to this fascinating personage than Dr. Ferber. So I give you Linda S. Ferber. Thank you, Jeff, and I'm happy to be here. Can everybody hear me? No, no. no okay. Um, okay, as you may have noticed from the sniffling coming from that corner, I sort of have a cold. So I don't know, do you want to amp this up a little? That's as loud as it is? Okay, so how's this? Yeah? Okay, okay, I'll do the best I can. So sorry for the sniffling. And there may be a moment out for a nose blow. <coughs> I'm delighted to be here this evening. I was very excited when I learned that this exhibition was in the works and I was honored to be asked to contribute to the catalog. It didn't come at an optimum time because we were deep in finishing up the exhibition at the National Gallery of Art, but um, the McMullen was kind enough to extend my deadline and so here it is. Um, How the Sea Kills the Trees, William T. Richards, I still call him William T. Richards, I know you all like William Tross Richards, but he never used this he never used trust. He was always a T. Okay, he never used um, trust. He signed everything, a letter, a check, a painting, a watercolor, a drawing, with the T. But um, he didn't use trust, but that's okay. I've sort of gotten used to it now. And, but I don't like trust Richards. So at any rate, my first digression. So I'm going to, um, to move through this. It is the topic of my... Um, of my essay, and I was thrilled to be able to um, go back to this material, which I had thought about a number of years ago. And if any of you are still in the room when I finish, I'll tell you an interesting history of this, uh, of this project. William Tross Richards' landscape and marine subjects, painted between 1854 and 1905, belonged to the larger 19th century discourse on nature. Landscape and marine images were flexible devices that accommodated many of the ideas and beliefs that engaged the artist and his patrons, as well as the wide audience for visual culture in the second half of the 19th century. <laughs> Landscape and marine paintings served as vehicles for expressions of national identity, as reflections of widespread interest in science, especially in geology and paleontology. Landscape and marine paintings also served as metaphors for private and collective anxieties, as the confident worldview of the early 19th century waned. In these several contexts, I'll consider a series of unusual works by Richards, lodged somewhere between landscape and marine paintings. Coastal paintings in which trees grow on sandy beaches, as you see here, at the ocean's edge. The subject preoccupied Richards between 1870 and 1877, during a period of tension and transition for the artist just at mid-career. So what were the tensions inherent in forging an identity as an American landscape painter? Richards entered what he called the race for fame in 1854. His idol Thomas Cole had died in 1848, but American landscape painters of the next generation were nurtured by his vision, including Richards' models and contemporaries, Frederick Edwin Church, John Frederick Kensett, and Jasper Cropsey, all of whom were based, unlike Richards, in New York City. But, Working under their influence in Philadelphia, Richards had mastered this 
Hudson River School mainstream style by 1857, which is demonstrated in a series of brilliant Adirondack landscapes executed for local patrons. In the Adirondack Mountains of 1857 is the virtual paradigm of the national landscape narrative. Notice the waterfall, the eagle, and the rainbow. You can probably see those. Okay, they're in the lower left corner for you, the lower right corner for me. Um, the eagle and the rainbow are, emblem, are emblems of nationhood and divine sanction. The point of view is elevated, panoramic, and commanding. The precise detail is informed by the artist's interest in geology as well as geological process, visualized in the waterfall and in the eroded and fissured face of the distant mountains. The painting belonged to Professor Joseph Leidy, an eminent paleontologist at the University of Pennsylvania, whose patronage suggests that Richard's images had visual and intellectual appeal in scientific as well as artistic circles. This moment of equilibrium between image, narrative, and reception would be short-lived for Richards. Mounting sectional tensions during the 1850s undermined the collective assumptions of political and cultural unity implied by such northern landscape subjects. Richards' own politics can be inferred by his marriage in 1856 to a Quaker, Anna Matlack, as well as his connection to Philadelphia abolitionist circles. Richard's choices of landscape subjects after 1857 reflected these tensions in his search for alternative landscape types, presenting other models and new narratives. The geological preoccupations of In the Adirondack Mountains also reflected the artist's knowledge of John Ruskin's modern painters. For example, barely a year after the Adirondack series, Richard's retreated from the panoramic program to embrace Ruskin's regimen of truth to nature, revealed in the hyper detail of this early all foreground Ruskinian landscape. By 1863, Richards was formally affiliated with the American Pre-Raphaelites based in New York, and during the Civil War, a number of his works conveyed political messages. Comparison here of the two, and it's significant. From the, um, from the ladders, from the Adirondack Mountains, elevated eagle's eye, we descend, we zoom down for a literal worm's eye view. A neglected corner is one of several botanical parables commenting upon the national crisis of social and political order embedded in the image of an invasion of cultivated crops, the wheat in the background, by weeds, the rankly luxuriant growth that has clambered over the wall and through the dilapidated gate. The title of these paintings is usually a giveaway, a neglected corner of the wheat field. During the 1860s and into the 1870s, Richards accommodated this ambivalence with the concurrent practice of dual landscape types. He alternated the expansive panorama of the national landscape with the claustrophobic micro detail of the American Pre-Raphaelites. Richards was probably the best known of their artist members. His paintings were admired, but almost always with reservations by mainstream critics who questioned, quote, the Ruskinian principles upon which they were executed. So I always say he decided to run away to sea. During these years, he also explored the New England coast as far north as Mount Desert Island and including excursions to Nantucket. There in April, his first, but his first um, uh, destination on the coast uh, began with summer forays to the sandy beaches of the New Jersey shore. And you see two, an oil and a watercolor, typical of beautiful early works, his interpretations of that particular flat beach with the long rows of rollers. During these years, he also explored the New England coast, as far north as Mount Desert Island, and including excursions to Nantucket. In Nantucket, in July and August 1865, he painted a series of small plein air studies <coughs> excuse me, but, <coughs> that were admired in print. Encouraged, the following summer, Richards visited Mount Desert Island, where he made studies that yielded several impressive exhibition pictures. Here, the looming mass of the Otter Cliffs of 1866 is captured in all its Ruskinian geological complexity. And yes, it is a bit exaggerated. But it also demonstrates his complete mastery of what I call the coastal sublime many years before his visits to the southern coast of England. From 1874 on, the artist and his growing family would summer regularly at Newport, and Rhode Island's varied coasts figured prominently from then on in his oils and watercolors. You have a fabulous selection of the so-called coupons. You see two of them here, the three by five watercolors that were sent uh, to his 
major patron, George Whitney in Philadelphia, to record the subjects that Richards was thinking about, um, painting in either oil or watercolor. And you notice that they're all, um, as the titles reveal, um, replete with the colonial charm of the, uh, of the spot, in addition to the, um, the wonderful landscapes that always included a distant view of the sea. These sites, along with subjects from forays along, uh, along the New Jersey beach, these were his two career-long signature subjects for the artist, who actually eventually settled at Newport. Spending the summer months at Greycliff, uh, the wonderful shingle-style house that he and his wife and a local architect designed and built for themselves in the early 1880s. And Rhode Island's varied coasts, as you can see here in both of these works, one dating from 1894 and one from 1893, figured prominently from then on in his oils and his watercolors. Now, Richards was not alone in his growing interest in the coast. A survey of exhibition records indicates a surge in numbers of such subjects during the 1860s. Established Hudson River School landscape painters like Kensett, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> whose beacon rock you see here, developed the coast as a side specialty. In 1869, you all know this painting, it's local, Winslow Homer painted one of his first coastal subjects in oil, portraying a seaside promenade at Long Branch, New Jersey. The particular seaside genre investigated here in Richard's work lies outside the conventions of traditional marine and coastal painting. These works are not ship paintings, they're not shipwrecks or maritime records of seaport activity, nor do these images belong like Homer's Long Branch to the modern life subject of seaside resorts. These particular motifs were drawn from the then largely uninhabited remoter stretches of New Jersey's northern coast. The subject preoccupied Richards between 1870 and 1877. Lone Trees Coast of New Jersey is the first major work on this theme that we know, and At Atlantic City is um, among the latest. These littoral zones, these border zones, comprised of sand, beaches, neither land nor sea, lapped by Atlantic waves, were perceived as deserts and wastelands outside the well-developed cult of scenery associated with images of the continent's interior which were cast as regions of pastoral cultivation or sublime wilderness. We're all familiar with that. When noted in the literature at all, ocean beaches comprised a form of anti-picturesque scenery, whose lack of visual appeal was characterized by Thoreau in his walks on Cape Cod as what he called the most uninviting landscape on earth. What then was the allure of this uninvited landscape for Richards and his generation? Richard's seaside forests were unusual, even within this coastal genre, because they married images that belonged to distinctly different conventions. Mature trees, common to the vocabulary of landscape painting, appear in a seascape setting as landscape aliens in a hostile environment. They are growing on a sand beach where the lower trunks are bathed at high tide by the salt water of ocean waves, washing away the sand to reveal, undermine, and ultimately destroy the roots. While the motif of trees struggling for survival at the coast was certainly not Richard's invention, these New Jersey forests became a signature subject for him between 1870 and 1877. I suggest that these melancholy images offer clues to Richard's state of mind during a difficult period of transition from a landscape to a marine painter. This reading is reinforced by a number of his titles. Most are in the realm of the topographical, at Atlantic City or Lighthouse Point. Some, however, invoke themes of isolation. For example, the Lone Trees, coast of New Jersey. The most provocative title is one called How the Sea Kills the Trees, assigned to a large unlocated watercolor of 1875. Richards was fascinated by the relentless forces operating at the edge of the continent. Commenting on another work in this series, the sea and its inroads on the beaches of New Jersey has destroyed the woods of cedar and holly which formerly grew to high water mark in the vicinity of Atlantic City. The extent of the series and the notice these works attracted suggests that the public also responded to these somber works. Art critics describe these paintings of drowning forests as, quote, quietly impressive, yet also as invoking desolation and barren. Yet Richard's most important patrons acquired these subjects. They were exhibited at major venues in the United States and abroad. And in a broader cultural and social context, these drowning forests might be read as powerful metaphors for the private anxieties and philosophical uncertainties of the post-war culture 
in which Richards and his audience operated. The Atlantic, Ser the Atlantic City series also offers a unique opportunity to study the particular pressures on a landscape specialist in the 1870s as American taste underwent profound changes. The great reputations of mid-century, Richard's own models, were on the wane. Cole was long dead, Churchwood virtually ceased painting by 1880, and Kensett died in 1872. By then, Richards and his generation faced the collapse of the market for, Ameri for the American Landscape School. In the face of growing critical and collector preference for contemporary European painters and American painters influenced by European training. Richards felt this turn of domestic taste keenly, and he lamented in a letter of 1879 to his main patron, George Whitney, for whom he painted the wonderful miniature coupons upstairs. He confided his fear that, I quote, the time has passed when the American people can hunger for my pictures. By 1870, Richards and others were already turning from landscape to marine themes. Coastal subjects in both the oil and the watercolor mediums offered the picture buying public an alternative to landscape. Richard's focus upon the seaside forests at Atlantic City was then both fortuitous and also premeditated, signaling his transition and his conflict by combining key elements of each genre in a somber and novel narrative that struck a resonant chord of melancholy within his audience. These paintings and watercolors also conferred, and this is important, scenic status upon a hitherto unrecognized stretch of coast. Richards was among the earliest artists to visit Atlantic City, probably in 1859 and certainly in 1860. The recent origin of Atlantic City was the story of a capital venture in which Philadelphia investors had required the right of way in 1852 for the Camden and Atlantic Railroad, completed in 1854. The same group <coughs> purchased hundreds of acres of oceanfront property on Epsecon Island an isolated destination some 62 miles from Philadelphia. This virtually uninhabited beach was the railroad terminus and planned site for a summer retreat convenient to Philadelphia. The speculative nature of the scheme was dubbed, quote, building a railroad to nowhere. Nowhere would prosper, as you see from this image, um, an engraving from um, Lippincott's magazine, I think 1873. By 1868, the summer population of this seaside resort was reported to be close to 40,000. The development of tourist industries on the Atlantic seaboard undoubtedly played a role in the new popularity of coastal scenery. <clears throat> Art exhibition listings offered paintings comprising a roll call of summer retreats for urban populations of Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. Newport, Cape Ann, Narragansett, Long Branch, and Atlantic City. The rise of coastal tourism, especially in New England, as the industries of fishing, whaling, and shipbuilding waned, has been well studied. Old settlements like Nantucket and Newport were redefined. Their seaside locales were promoted as therapeutic retreats, both physical and spiritual, for urban dwellers. Equally attractive was the allure of an undifferentiated, quaint 18th century past, which you saw in the coupons of Newport, conferred upon these communities by the ascendant colonial revival. Donna Brown has aptly defined the period of 1875 to 1900 as one of what she calls nostalgic touring. We still do it today. Richard's choice of Newport as a summer residence was astute. A Quidneck Island was, in his own words, a mine of beauty entirely unworked. Picturesque scenery resonant with historic associations abounded, as well as a population, and this is important, of socially and intellectually prominent potential patrons with purchasing power. So in contrast, Atlantic City, uh, unlike Newport, had been recently developed on an unpicturesque terrain, unhallowed by a colonial past. The destination's attractions and associations had to be invented from whole cloth, an enterprise in which guidebooks and travel literature, as well as Richard's oil paintings and watercolors, all played a key role. Guidebooks and articles hailed the 10-mile-long expanse of um, Absecon and Brigantine beaches, the salt meadows, the panoramic views to be obtained from the Absecon Lighthouse. Richards recorded many of these sites in the early 1870s, as well as the pine and cedar forests also extolled in the guidebook literature. And you see a black and white of a large, this is one of the um, two by three foot watercolors. Um, this is un unlocated, um, but it was famous in its day. It was exhibited at the Philadelphia Centennial. 
And um, the, it was ex these were extolled, these pine and cedar forests were extolled in the literature. They were called the endless woods of pine, sand planted, strew over that boundless beach, a murmur like the sea. Their poetry, however, was a poignant one, for the visitors were also informed that these endless woods were doomed to destruction by the coastal erosion that was threatening by 1868 to topple the lighthouse as well. Such notions played to the dark side of the coastal landscape, never far below the surface in this border zone. By 1873, Kensett was identified with Atlantic City forests in the way that Kensett had been associated, as you see here, since the 1850s with the Newport landscape. And I quote from an article by A.G. Penn in 1873, two of our best marine painters in their works offer us a choice of coast landscape. Kensett paints the still bare crags standing out of his foregrounds, keen, fresh, beautiful, severe. It would take a stout pair of New England lungs to breathe enjoyably in such an air. That is the northern coast. Mr. William Richards gives us the southern. You can look at the, the black and white. The landscape, in fact, of Atlantic City. In his scenes, we have the infinite, the infinitude of soft silver beach, the rolling tumultuous of a boundless sea, and twisted cedars mounted like toiling ships on the crests of undulating sand hills. Richards himself wrote of this watercolor, paraphrasing, paraphrasing Tennyson, that it seems like a wasteland, whence no one has come since the beginning of time. Now, in Kensett's work, you see the distant sails. There is usually, I mean, they are quite severe, but there is usually some relieving um, point that might, might sort of cast a tiny little bit of a holiday, a holiday spirit. The sails on the horizon, often not here, but on the top of the, of the parapets, the cliffs, the headlands, there are tiny figures painted. They're clearly you know, excursionists out for um, a stroll along the seaside. But the opposition proposed here between Kensett's vision of a terrain that required stout New England lungs and the soft southern beaches of Richards suggests the operation of a coastal hierarchy of region and gender, stout versus soft, and New England versus Southern, that I think might call for further study. These contrasts would have been still very loaded terms in 1873, less than a decade after the Civil War. This increase in production of coastal and marine paintings by Richards and others was met by interest among patrons and dealers just at the moment when the appetite for American landscape paintings was ebbing. <coughs> Richard's Atlantic City paintings and watercolors, like Kensett's paintings of New England coast, organized audience responses to these sites. Their paintings commemorated whole sets of associations and memories for those who frequented these sites, and perhaps more important, established, it, established the coast as an attractive destination. In this way, the rise of nostalgic tourism, as well as the value of seaside real estate, served to reinforce the lure of the uninviting landscape. But there were other narratives at work as well. What general associations did the audience bring to these sites? What other narratives might coastal and marine subjects have carried for an audience of the 1860s and the 1870s? The development of an elaborate iconography of continental landscape imagery to accommodate and naturalize the expansive impulses of the day has been very well studied. We've seen a prime example of the mode in Richard's early Adirondack landscape. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Less investigated has been the American attention focused on the sea. In fact, exploration of the ocean floor was underway in surveys conducted in the 1850s and 60s for the laying of telegraphic cables, as well as for the purpose of scientific investigation. American oceanographer Matthew Maury's pioneering work, The Physical Geography of the Sea, was published in 1855. Between 1854 and 1860, financier Cyrus Westfield promoted the enterprise to lay the first submarine telegraph cable between America and Europe. These explorations drew public attention to the ocean floor as well as to the edges. The scientific study of deep sea soundings and dredges had profound implications, reversing earlier perception, perceptions of the ocean floor as incapable of supporting any life form at such depths. The long-held theory of the so-called Azoic zone, below 400 fathoms, <clears throat> had proposed a frigid waste of utter darkness. 
In the wake of new discoveries, however, these are specimens brought up by the dredging for the, um, uh, for the laying of cables, the abyss was transformed in the popular imagination from an inhospitable environment to the very cradle of life, a timeless zone thought to be inhabited by living fossils. And in a way, you can see some of these here. This scientifically erroneous but powerful idea suggested that the key to the Earth's past and to the process of evolution lay in a deep and changeless ocean floor. The shallower littoral zones, the same beaches and coasts frequented by tourists and artists, were also active sites for the practice of marine science, paleontology, and geological investigation. The famous Harvard geologist and zoologist, Louis Agassiz, who you see here, conducted well-publicized coastal surveys along the Atlantic coast from Massachusetts to Florida. And we'll talk about this extraordinary um, watercolor, uh, Shisley's ocean life, um, in, in a moment. The fascination with the marine environment and marine life was manifested in popular culture by the aquarium phase craze of the 1850s, and surely played a role in stimulating landscape painters to experiment with coastal subjects. Edward Moran's The Valley and the Sea is one of the most extraordinary paintings produced um, in the 19th century, and it is surely um, uh, the product of this kind of um, fascination with the ocean floor. In fact, many of the flora and fauna that you see in the ocean life, a close-up study, um, appear in his painting, and this is not surprising because the same person um, commissioned both of these. He's Dr. James M. Somerville, who was a Philadelphia physician and an amateur naturalist. And he even collaborated with Schusseli, um, who portrayed this lively convention of marine flora and fauna as instructed by his scientific partner, who published the image as a chromolithograph in his 1859 publication, Ocean Life. These marine images are of particular interest because they were produced in Philadelphia by artists who were part of Richard's professional and social circle. And the ocean life, for me as a curator, I will say, is one of the things that got away. This came up at a humble sale, um, at either Christie's or Sotheby's, many, many years ago, and I was desperate to get it. But Kevin Avery, then of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, snatched it away. So I'm glad at least it's in a public collection and not too far away, but I just... I just think this is an unbelievable picture. Thus, I would say, to meditate upon the ocean around 1860 was to entertain a number of powerful ideas, associations that were both retrospective and progressive. It was to celebrate technological and scientific progress while speculating upon the dawn of time and the larger challenges to faith posed by recent discoveries in natural history, paleontology, and geology. Research in these, di in these disciplines theorized a complex origin for the Earth, far beyond that offered by Genesis. The ideas proposed a pre-human Earth history of unimaginable length, a paradigm shift now known as deep time. The vast scale of geological time was visible in the rock strata, dramatically exposed in glaciated mountainsides and eroded sea cliffs. While formative, and I love the fact that there are rocks in this exhibition, it's brilliant, and fossils, so you're in for a treat if you haven't seen it. While formative glaciers were long gone from the mountains and coasts of the Northeast, the daily ebb and flow of ocean tides were a profound manifestation of time and mutability, a reminder of physical forces operating for millions of years to form, destroy, and refashion the face of the Earth. In their earlier marine paintings, two real masterworks are here, both Richards and Alfred T. Britcher presented tidal motion in precise detail as rows of long, leathery waves creeping up on the shining sands in vaguely threatening serpentine undulations. Richards Atlantic Coast was admired as, quote, an achievement in art which is a real glory to America. It must be seen to be appreciated for the impression of its implacable truthfulness. And evocative titles like Richard's Time and Tide, and that is his title for the painting, um, drew on a line from Sir Walter Scott's The Antiquary, and I think an earlier, an earlier publication as well. Oh, I think a later publication. I think Charles Dickens also used it. And it's Time and Tide Tarry for No Man, marrying the belief that the passing of time and the recurrence of tides are profound evidence of eternal processes 
far beyond human control. Now we get to the fun part. Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species, published in 1859, introduced the theory of natural selection to explain past and present forms of life, proposing another unsettling mechanism at work. Long-held assumptions of permanence were again challenged by the idea of inevitable change in life forms. Popular scientific narratives like Guillaume Louis Figuier's Earth Before the Deluge, first published in Paris in 1863, presented the geological periods, you see an illustration here, and the life forms they supported as an illustrated guidebook through time. Engravings prepared for Figuier's book by Edward Ryu appropriated traditional marine and coastal images to provide convincing visualizations of the earliest epochs of Earth history. These images were widely circulated. Sand beaches and rocky shores provided the imagined environments for grotesque and gigantic creatures. The ocean and its borders were reinvented as the early world, an association rapidly assimilated into popular culture. The shore became a highly potent imaginative site where past and present seemed to meet and merge. Our friend A.G. Penn, again, demonstrates the ease with which the contemporary imagination freely associated about deep time at the ocean's edge. He's the author of the, um, uh, the article um, about Atlantic City that we saw earlier. Evoking the mythic drowned island civilization of antiquity, Penn proclaimed Atlantic City as the new Atlantis. He wrote, to walk upon the sand is, in a sense, to walk upon the bottom of the ocean. Here are strange marls, and these are sedimentary, uh, sedimentary clays of fossil origin. The relics of infinite animal life into which has sunk the gigantic lizard of antiquity who cranes his snaky throat at us in the museum, swelling with the tale of immemorial times when he weltered here in the sunny ooze. They don't write travel articles like that anymore. <laughs> These collective fantasies conferred prehistories and new meanings upon coastal topography. In this context, one of my favorite paintings in the world, Elie Vedder's well-known painting of 1864, The Lair of the Sea Serpent, is not simply an enigmatic romantic fantasy, but in this context, it's also a marvelous window opened into deep time. We enter a coastal twilight zone, an undifferentiated geological past, where gi gi gigantic lizards suggest a far earlier world of Darwinian struggle among predatory creatures, a competition still manifest in the eternal contrast between land and sea, and even invoked, I believe, by the snaky wave patterns of Richards and Britcher in those two early paintings that we saw. Other voices suggest that Richards' images struck a similar chord on both sides of the Atlantic. London Times critic Tom Taylor admired Richard's 1872 <coughs> Royal Academy submission, which is Lone Trees. A new name, he wrote, is attached to one of the most quietly impressive pictures here, the Lone Trees coast of New Jersey, where the thin line of foam runs up on the wind-winnowed sand, rises a clump of ragged alders and firs, with an effect of desolation and dreariness that cannot be conveyed in words. Taylor recognized the painting as something novel, the so-called dreary landscape, evolving in Victorian painting during the 1870s and 80s as a vehicle for the late 19th century mood, one might say the fin de siècle mood, expressing <clears throat> cultural ambivalence in response to social tensions. Success in London must have encouraged Richards to submit at Atlantic City, um, an engraving of which is um, at, um, at your left, I write, uh, to the 1873 Paris Salon. The painting was also engraved, as you see here, for George W. Sheldon's American Painters, an important survey of contemporary painting published in the United States in 1879. And Sheldon wrote, it is a subject too barren to attract many artists very strongly, but Mr. Richard's treatment of it has made it positively picturesque. Sheldon also affirmed Richard's status by selecting him as one of the 50 artists included in his published canon. When American Painters was published, Richard's was already a year into his first English sojourn from 1878 to 1880, seeking the sublime in Cornwall and Dorset, and you'll see plenty of that upstairs, along Britain's celebrated southern coast, 
His portrayals of Tintagel and Land's End would be staples of his later career. American and British audiences appreciated these works as well as his interpretations of the Rhode Island coast and New Jersey's treeless broad beaches. Only at the end of his career <coughs> would the artist return to the motif of Atlantic City's seaside forests. As one player in a quartet of small landscape paintings executed for his old friend and longtime dealer, Samuel P. Avery. These paintings evoke the seasons, perhaps the oldest of landscape narratives. The times of the year are portrayed in different regions, long familiar to both men, and they're enlisted here to commemorate the four ages of man. Spring is probably a Pennsylvania landscape, perhaps Chester County or Germantown. Summer could be the Catskills, but it's more likely a New Hampshire scene. Autumn, I believe, is um, a view off of Quidneck Island or, um, or even um, uh, Canonicut, Jamestown Island. And um, the drowning forests of Atlantic City are cast as winter. And with all the caveats about neat endings, considering the date of 1900 and the patron artist friendship, this sequence surely must be read as a mutually self-conscious re recapitulation at the turn of the century of two lifetimes of work over 50 years, creating and placing American paintings. Each site and each season carried its own freight of private and collective memory, closing with an image intended to be emblematic of both human mortality and the fin de siècle, as the sea drowns the trees at the edge of terra firma and at the end of their world. Thank you. Now, it's, it's very, not done yet. It's very interesting that, um, is it nine o'clock yet? No, okay. Um, it's very interesting that um, Avery died in August of 1904, Richards died in November of 1905. And they were true, truly sort of one of the, you know, the last um, sort of great men in um, the world of American art. The interesting thing is, it may not have escaped the notice of some of you, but there's a certain echo critical um, theme running through this. Um, the idea of the erosion, the idea of the rise of, of sea level because of melting glaciers, and the idea of um, erosion of the coasts. And it's very interesting how sometimes things catch up. I mean, I, I first gave a paper on this topic in 1996 at, an, at an, um, a session organized by Beth Johns for the Organization of American Historians on um, um, uh, paintings as history. And when I came back to the material um, this year, I was astonished at it, it had acquired a whole new, a whole new set of meetings and associations, just open the newspaper, just listen to the news. And it was fascinating to me how, um, you know, so you can play with that as you wish. You know, I don't want to be presentist, but it's extreme. There are just some themes that are, that are universal. And this one has kind of come to the foreground in, in our world and our time as one of absolutely critical importance. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to field them. It's a wonderful show. I'm really delighted to have contributed to the catalog. And I was really thrilled to have a chance to go back to those ancient yellowed files <laughs> and see that um, the, the, the topic was even more interesting looking at it now than it was. And, um, and both the curator and, um, and William Vareko were tireless in seeking the paintings that I asked them to find. <laughs> they couldn't always borrow them, but um, I managed to you know, have uh, color transparencies of them. So they're, they're in the book. Um, any questions? Yes. The man? Yeah. Well, that's a, it's a really interesting question. Uh, my interest in the man has, quite frankly, increased as I have matured. Um, I told someone earlier today that there were times when I was doing my dissertation that I wished he had died in 1880 because it would have saved me 25 years of writing. Um, I no longer feel that way. I have walked back from that position profoundly. <laughs> The late, sea, the late seascapes and the landscapes of the 1880s painted in Chester County 
have remarkable narratives associated uh, with them, and they're, they're wonderful pictures. Um, I think that catalog was the one where I came the closest to really thinking about the life, because it dealt, and also um, the two catalogs on the coupons, the miniature watercolors that were painted for George Whitney, who died suddenly in 1885. He had the largest holdings of Richard's work and, and many, many other major paintings as well, American and European. And he died in debt, and the entire collection was dumped on market. At the end of 1885, everything had to be liquidated by the end of the year. And that wreaks havoc with an artist's market and reputation. I mean, so it brought me in contact with these kinds of tremendous challenges. Um, in his life. And the Chester County landscapes to me became a valiant attempt at recovery to show that he too could paint in a, for him, slightly broader style. Um, uh, the, the two masterpieces that we couldn't get for the show, um, uh, particularly Old Ocean's, um, well, Old Ocean's Gray and Melancholy. Waste. Thank you, Waste. Um, but especially a painting at the, at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts called February is an absolutely extraordinary painting. And it show, it's, a, it's the gloaming. It's that moment of twilight. And it's through, silhouetted through bare trees. It's something that Benjamin Leader specialized in Victorian painting at the same time. And it's an extraordinary painting. Um, and it was a claim. And it was appreciated at the time as, as an amazing departure for a man who had been pegged in a certain way. And indeed, whose career had pretty much collapsed. I mean, his market recovered a bit. Avery was a key in that. So I would say the two, the Mine of Beauty at Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, and then the, one, the show, earlier show at the Met, and then the Brandywine um, Pastoral Interlude um, exhibition, which I love because it opened about a day and a half before 9-11. And I really felt that it was just, it was, it was amazing. I mean, to be working on that project and have the world, literally the world changed. The world changed. So those are, those are three catalogs, I think, that um, um, do you know, delve into. The others, I was more of a traditional art historian. You know, most, I was interested in just the works, man, you know, just the works. Um, <laughs> but I've grown older, certainly, and hopefully a little bit wiser. So anybody else? Yes? It seems that you did go back to, you built Graceland, mm -hmm. and then you seem to kind of not stay there. Well, they no, they. He he bought the farm, no pun intended, um, to provide a living for his daughter and her husband. They had a poultry farm there, and truck garden serviced Philadelphia. But he would go out in the summers to paint. So um, and they couldn't stay, and they would alternate with um, the, with Greycliff. And they couldn't stay on the island in the winter because it was too brutal. Um, so he was somewhat peripatetic. I mean, he lived when his genius son, Theodore William Richards, was at Harvard at a very tender age. Um, the whole family moved to Cambridge because he was just, he was a teenager. He was too young to be, you know, left alone um, uh, in, in the world of the, uh, of the university. So they spent time in Cambridge. And then, of course, a sojourn in England and then many, many trips after that, all of which are um, represented upstairs and wonderful, wonderful works. Some of them developed into exhibition works and his, his sketchbooks and his drawings are beyond. They're really just beyond. And it was a great generation of draftsmen. Many of them, Richards included, were trained originally as engravers. Mm -hmm. So their control of line was absolutely phenomenal. And even among them, he stands out as an extraordinary practitioner. Oh. Anyone else? They're unbelievable. They were all energetic. He did so many trips to Europe, which was a tough thing in those days. They were all phenomenally hardy people. It's just extraordinary. Normally, you think of Bierstadt when the, when the first transcontinental trip was overland. Um, uh, they're, they're, yes, they are perhaps, I don't know whether they're a different breed than we are, um, <laughs> but they were, you know, and they were accustomed to. What's, uh, someone has told me that people who are hale and hearty in the world today are often um, societies that are deconvenienced 
they live in places where we would consider them deprived because they don't have the mod cons, the modern conveniences. But being deconvenienced means you have to pick and carry and walk upstairs and et cetera, et cetera. And um, it builds, you know, it builds you up. Well, they were very deconvenienced, you might say, um, certainly in the 19th century, even with the advances. And, um, but they were amazing. They were amazing. Yes. Uh, I really appreciated your comments at the end about the eco-critical dimension of this work. And I also appreciated your um, uh, cautiousness about not being present in this. And I wondered if one way around that would be to think about Richard's relationship to industrialization in his own time, which was affecting the American landscape. Oh, absolutely. And I wonder whether you see in the ocean consuming the trees some sort of displaced anxiety. Oh, it's, it's absolute anxiety. Um, it's, it's the end of a world. And, um, and he was, I mean, George Whitney made his fortune from manufacturing locomotive wheels. Um, and it was his fortune that fueled much of Richard's career. So there's always that uneasy, you know, patronage. Um, but you also find um, in the letters, the letters are wonderful. The letters are the way to know the man. And they are at the Archives of American Art and they are, they are online and you can access them. And he was, he was educated at the, um, <coughs> excuse me, at the high school in, um, in Philadelphia, two years. It was similar to the Boston Latin School. It was a high school, but it was really like an, a, a, an early sort of first two years of college. He was, um, he was from a humble family. Uh, he was clearly brilliant. He stayed in touch with all his high school friends, but he had to go to work at an early age because his father died and he was the oldest boy. But he was deeply intellectual. His reading was voracious. And this is touched on in the book. Um, I think um, certainly um, Becky Bedell's article about melancholy is a wonderful exploration of, um, of his, um, like all of them, um, his deep, deep love of, um, of 19th century nature poetry. And um, so I would say those, you know, those <clears throat> publications of mine, Becky's, certainly Becky's article, and then those, those exhibitions on times of real crisis for him are ways, I think, to get to know the man. He was truly, he was truly a noble. I mean, I have never, even Bierstadt, um, Bierstadt and his wife came to call, it's a very funny letter, came to call at his Newport studio. And Richard said, we were really quite nervous, you know? Um, and so we, you know, we spiffed everything up and he said, the big B came into the studio and he prowled around examining things like a lion on the hunt while Mrs. B, you know, fluttered in her leghorn hat and her beautiful ribbons. And then they, they left and we heaved a sigh of relief. But, um, and you, you know, you understood what he meant by the big B, but he didn't disparage. He also said Whistler is a man of tremendous talent. Unfortunately, he carries very little ballast. Um, so there were, you know, he, he was open. He was open to new ideas. And I don't think I ever, except for one critic, who I now know the smoking gun, it was Clarence Cook, who savaged him um, during the 1860s when he was an American pre-Raphaelite. And that is, but he only said, be grateful that you're not an artist and you're not subject to the torment of savage critics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I finally figured out who it was working on this exhibition. Um, but that's about as intense as I've ever seen him express a negative. Yes? You mentioned Greycliff in your book, and mm -hmm. I've read, I was actually shocked to learn that the government uh, took... In their wisdom. <laughs> you know, they, they took Greycliff and the house was destroyed. They took it. The point, it's a point, you know, at the entrance to the bay, right. and they took it to build a fortification. Um, this was started in the late 1890s, and uh, they were worried about the coastline being unguarded, et cetera, et cetera. So they condemned the house, which meant they had no choice. Um, they did pay them $100,000 for the land, which actually was shrewdly invested and which kept a number of the, um, a number of the, um, the children you know, um, in good shape for m much of their lives. 
But yes, the, ho the, the, um, the house was demolished. There are some photographs, which you see there are in various publications you know, that show them. It was an exquisite house. And there was a studio building behind it, which was a little hip-roofed. Um, and uh, yes, and it, you know, so in a way you sort of fold, fold um, the disappearance of, of Greycliff, you know, into this, this fin de siècle mood that you see in, um, you know, in, in winter. And this beautiful photograph um, of, of Richard's, one of my very favorites. Uh, and his daughter, his granddaughter, Edith Price, who I knew very well, I met her in 1970, and she was just a phenomenal woman. Uh, she died just shy of 100. And she lived with her grandfather in Newport, and she remembered a summer or two at Greycliff. Um, and she said in her tart way, she couldn't, she wouldn't have been old enough, to, I don't know, to remember this, I don't think so. <coughs> but her <coughs> apocryphal stories were hot off the press. <coughs> she said, the first time they fired the guns from um, Fort Wetherill, every window in Newport broke. Um, so they decided it was a little too far inland. And so it was, you know, it was abandoned as a fortification not long after. And it's now a state park. It's really quite beautiful. I've been out there. Fortunately, it was typically an unbelievably foggy day. So my slides are a lot of swirling mist. Um, uh, but it's, yes, uh, fortunately, as I said, it is, it is, preserved, the interior is preserved in photographs, and, and research has been done, I think Bill would know, on the architect, and, the, um, and, the, and they, they came back from England completely enamored with the aesthetic movement and the work of William Morris, and there's a lot of rich material that was in the house. And, and I, I take it from maybe assuming that that had uh, a significant impact on of course, but you know they were pretty. They're pretty tight-lipped. Um, there's one of my favorite letters is where he and I think he and Whitney are writing about a friend who's desperately ill, and um, and Richards, you know, says it is our duty to hope. I mean, they, you know, they really, they were, they were not unfeeling. They were deeply feeling, but they contained. This. Yes, of course, it must have been a tremendous blow. And his wife had just died. Um, he was probably glad Anna was gone when that, you know, when the house, when the house went. So he, yes, major blows. Um, but he, he lived and he painted. And he, he died in November of 1905, and he was painting right up to the end of his life. So he was quite, he had a very supportive and loving family. It's like Asher B. Durand. I think that really contributes to the longevity and the productive life um, uh, of anyone but particularly an artist. Yes? I thought I read that he built a subsequent home in Jamestown in the Beaver Field. Well, Greycliff was on Jamestown. Oh, I know. That's the house. A, a subsequent house? Yeah, I thought I read that. I don't that. know. Bill? No, maybe you're conf confusing it with Clingstone, which is a house no, no, no. that... I mean, I And he bought a house in town. Living you might be thinking of Arnold Avenue, yeah. which was his, which was, it was their winter house. You couldn't be on the island in the, in the winter. So they lived in Newport in the winter, and, um, and there are some wonderful photographs. You have photographs of the book, don't you? Yes, of, of that house, which is still there, although it's been altered. Yes? When he went uh, to Europe on all of those trips, Usually they did. The whole family went from 1878 to 1880. It's amazing. He hauled those kids, five kids around, five surviving children. They went everywhere together. Um, and I think they finally decided to settle down. They liked Newport so much, and I think it was getting a little unwieldy to pull up stakes from G their Germantown house and haul off to another place and get settled again. And so um, they, they made that their headquarters. And he would go off on excursions both north and south to sketch and study, but <coughs> the, the base of operations was Newport. He, he was such a skilled draftsman or drawer, as you mentioned in your sketchbooks. Did he have any use at all for photography? Oh, he collected, he had photographs, and he was, he was aware of it. And he even had, there's a, in my dissertation, look to the very end, he, he had a Kodak at the very end of his life, and he used it, he, he used it. Um, yes. No, he was not averse um, to anything, really. He, he 
he wasn't too crazy about Impressionism, but he thought it was really interesting. You know, he went to see the first big show that Duran Ruel sent to New York, um, and he was not deeply impressed, but he, you know, he was not without interest and without sympathy, actually. Yes? Uh, through your talk, through this wonderful show, Professor Howell, these four star gave you like this to know them. So uh, my question is, how did you get started? Oh, I'll tell you exactly how, and then I'll stop. <clears throat> As you get older, you just get very garrulous. I was, I was um, an assistant curator at the Brooklyn Museum. And it was, I came there, I rounded off to 1970, but it was 1969, late in 1969. Mm -hmm. And um, there were at that time, there was a rotunda on the, on the um, fifth floor of a museum that those of you who know the museum are familiar with. And at that time, um, it was a permanent watercolor display. You know, we used to sort of keep watercolors up for much longer than we do now. And, um, you know, and it was changed from time to time, but there really is very little natural light in there. But at any rate, I was walking through, I hadn't been there long, and I was looking across the rotunda, and I saw this extraordinary watercolor, which just was light. It was not a large watercolor. It was in one of his portfolio, a nine by 13. And I just walked across, I remember, I walked across the gallery, across the rotunda to see what it was. And it was an exquisite watercolor. We, we, there are some of them upstairs like that. There, we saw some of them here. And um, I looked, and I, I had never heard of him. Now, I was, you know, I was working on a, a doctorate in art history you know, at Columbia, but I was completely unfamiliar with his work. So I went up, and I looked in our catalog, and I saw that we had a lot of work by him. And so I was looking through the photographs. And many of them were early gifts. There was a particular bequest in 1953 that his daughter, Anna Richards Brewster, her share of the estate, the estate was divided five ways, the five surviving children. And she um, asked her husband to distribute her share of the estate, along with some of her work, to American museums. And one museum, when I, and I sort of dutifully writing to all the museums, one museum, this is in like 1970, hadn't even unpacked them yet. Um, but Brooklyn, Brooklyn was the beneficiary of that, like many other museums. And then there were things that came in very early on, um, when his, you know, because Brooklyn is a very old museum. And I, so I asked Barbara Novak, who was my advisor, and I said, you know, I'm looking for a dissertation topic. I would like to do a monographic dissertation. Um, and this, you know, the little bit of work that I've done is that he seems like a, you know, an interesting artist. I didn't even know about the American Pre-Raphaelites then. Mm -hmm. And um, what do you think? And she said, I don't know his work well, but I think, I think he's very interesting. I think you should pursue it. So I started going through old catalogs, many of them at the Newport Art Association, and I kept seeing this name, Edith Ballinger Price, as a lender. And so I wrote to the Newport Art Association, and they told me that Miss Price had just relocated to Virginia Beach, um, and they gave me her address. And I wrote to her, and she, she sent, it's like a scholar's dream, she said, thank God. You know, someone has come along. She said, I've been meaning to do this for all my life. You know, she was about 70 then, and um, younger than I am now, which is really sobering. And she said, you know, I know I'll never do it. You know, I'll just never do it. I have many things to show you, but my brother has just passed away, and I need some time, and come and see me. You know, you'll come and see me. Well, I went to see her, and that was the beginning. And she was immensely generous. I went back with a little suitcase. We went to Woolworths, and we bought a little plastic suitcase, and she sent me back with all the letters. And she said, use these, you know, and then we'll figure out what should be done with them when you're finished with them. And they're now in the archives of American art. But it was like a scholar's, it was really like a scholar's dream. And, um, and so he has been, as I said to someone earlier, the gift that never stops giving. You know, I've worked on him, really, I think, quite productively for what is now getting to be my entire career. And there's just always, you change, the moment change is the eco-critical issue now. Um, and I was so stunned when I reread this material and I suddenly was thinking about it in a very contemporary framework. Um, and uh, so um, he doesn't owe me a thing. I owe him, <laughs> I owe him a great deal. And I hope that this exhibition, because the wonderful thing about this show is its breadth. I, I said to Jeff, I was a little worried when I saw the PowerPoints. I thought, I mean, I don't know how they're going to gather this stuff all in one place, 
but it's organized beautifully. And you see here, you see here, you could say the dark underbelly. You don't just see exhibition paintings. You see sketches, you see studies, some of them completed, some of them not completed. You follow the artist um, you know, through his entire process. The drawings are a revelation. I mean, I know them pretty well, but they're, they're just phenomenal. He was a great, great draftsman his entire, his entire life. The sketchbooks are on turning page, which is great, so you can go, go through them. Uh, and he was a noble man. He simply was a noble man. Um, his, his granddaughter used to say, my grandfather, grandfather believed in the eternal verities. And um, you could say, oh, God, is that corny? But no, it's true. He did. And we use them as a, we had our own sort of, we always refer to them as the EVs <laughs> during our long, our long cor correspondence. Capital E, capital V. And that was, he was the genuine, he was really the genuine article. And uh, at any rate. Thank you.